I think it is about time we stop allowing Europeans and North Americans to claim the category humanity. For too long, they have spoken for abstract human. And I think we need to refuse that. And we need to lay claim to the concept of humanity and not only to the concept of our culture. You know, you mentioned this idea of a non-aligned movement. Uh, Will it be something similar to the one advocated by uh, India, Yugoslavia, Indonesia before, or slightly different? You know, it's a really good question you raise about the non-aligned movement. Certainly the context in the 1950s at Bandung, for instance, mm -hmm. when Cho and Lai, Nehru and others gathered, met each other for the first time. And then the founding of the non-aligned movement in Belgrade in 1961. The context then was also um, impending military clash, nuclear clash between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, that was the main issue on the agenda and so on. But the situation was different. Globalization of the kind we see now was nowhere on the picture. Um, now countries are far more integrated with each other. We can see this, you know, with the way inflation rates uh, so quickly get imported into countries. You know, uh, global inflation, uh, within weeks you get food price inflation impacting every country in the world. Um, that's a mark of the kind of integration that we have now. So it's difficult to imagine um, a non-aligned movement of the 1950s and 60s just emerging today in the same way. You will remember that for decades, at the G77, which is the UN block of the NAM, China was not a member of the G77, and the votes used to be G plus, one. plus C. <laughs> yes, it was G77 plus C, uh, C mm -hmm. for China. Uh, mm -hmm. But now China seems much more interested in being a direct party at the table of some of these conversations. And I think that changes the nature of the non-aligned kind of posture considerably. Um, if you have China, Russia, uh, India, Brazil, South Africa, for instance, in October, if Lula da Silva wins the election in Brazil, um, this is going to return Brazil back to multilateralism. Um, Brazil departed from the multilateral project in 2016 with the downfall of the government of President Dilma. The return of Brazil to multilateralism the return of India to multi multilateralism during the Ukraine crisis. I know very well that President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa is extremely keen in the revitalization of some kind of non-alignment for the African continent. All of this, um, I think, could change the equation. Mm -hmm. So we are at a situation now where if China and Russia and other big countries actually sit at the table and if they are open to talking to European countries who are themselves struggling between this false certainty and the dilemmas, I think we could drive an interesting agenda. Do you feel, for instance, that in China there is an appetite for this kind of non-alignment? Uh, I think this is a great idea. Let's discuss again this idea of uh, non-alignment. Uh, the point is, uh, indeed, there is something we need to put China, Russia, India, Brazil, and other major developing countries together. But which concept could be uh, the most appropriate? One is, of course, non-alignment. And the other is whether, I just uh, see whether Vijay's view on that, should we just call non-Western world? Or will that be uh, things with this Ukraine war we can see very clearly with regard to sanctions on Russia, there are two clear-cut different attitudes against or for. So, so West and non-West. So whether we should call it a non-aligned movement or non-Western, uh, what I call movement or whatever, uh, what kind of uh, a term which will be very important, you know, we should explore that, yeah. See, it's interesting. I, I, I sympathized with your statement about Asian wisdom. Um, but 
we should also admit that Asian wisdom is sometimes lacking. Um, you know, when we look at the projects of unifying continents in Latin America, they have gone quite a ways towards um, at least ideological unity. They call it Patria Grande, the great homeland. Um, mm -hmm. They have concepts, you know, of Bolivarianism and so on. In Africa, they have the concept of Pan-Africanism. Um, mm -hmm. This is a vital concept, which I know the African Union thinks about and considers. Asia actually has had a very unfortunate history. Our Pan-Asian history, in a way, was hijacked by Japanese imperialism of the 1930s and 40s. And we were never really able to recover Asianism as a continental view. The divides are so great. So I, I empathize and sympathize with your term Asian wisdom. But I worry that we are also, um, we have a big mountain to climb in terms of building trust across Asian countries, um, building a project of some sort of Asian unity. We are claiming um, a kind of globalization, a kind of internationalism. You know, we are making a claim for humanity. Um, they are basically stuck in a 19th century warlike, you know, Congress of Vienna, Metternich, uh, Henry Kissinger. This is an out of date form of thinking, this sort of Congress of Vienna, Metternich form of thinking, you know, divide the world up, um, use military force, um, you know, make people uh, fear you and so on. I don't want that world. We can, if we want, we can call it Western, but I'm, I'm afraid it's not entirely only Western. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, we saw that in Asia in the 1930s and 40s. Um, we don't want that. We don't want a return to militarism, war, intimidation. You know, what is the sanctions regime but a form of economic warfare? You know, we don't want all that. What we want is to make a claim to humanity. And I feel like the platform, whether it's BRICS, a new kind of G77, you know, the UN General Assembly, whatever the platforms, and we should use all of them, whatever the platform, we speak from humanity. We don't speak from territory. And the reason I feel that's important is that I think it is about time we stop allowing Europeans and North Americans to claim the category humanity. For too long, they have spoken for abstract human. And I think we need to refuse that. And we need to lay claim to the concept of humanity and not only to the concept of our culture. Um, they are actually more parochial than we are. Uh, they are much more parochial. They have a parochial understanding of power. But we have a humanist understanding of um, the capacity of, of people and nature. And I think that's why I would say, let's, let's be bold. Let's be a little, you know, um, let's be a little ambitious. Yeah, I agree with your uh, statement. You know, the Western uh, concept of humanism is much more uh, parochial than at least the Chinese one, maybe also Indian one. You know, remember, you know, in both Confucius classics, in the Bible, there is a phrase called don't do unto others what do you do unto others that do unto you. But in the Chinese literature, this on the top of all the values, this is one of the top values. But in the Bible, it's way behind. So in other words, uh, the degree of importance and priority is different. That shows difference in terms of whether it's comprehensive, broader, or parochial.